watch now. Hello everyone. I start by praising our creator and fashioner and asking to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers uh, and upon all of us and upon all of the righteous uh, people until the last day. I want to thank the IPCI for hosting me in South Africa, making it possible for me to be here. Uh, I thank uh, the organizers and management of this mosque for giving us the opportunity to speak here tonight. I want to thank uh, my friend James for agreeing to have this uh, dialogue with me. He has had a very busy schedule and uh, I'm, I'm so glad that I'm part of that uh, schedule with this debate tonight. Now, the proposition before us is about uh, sin and salvation in both the Quran and the Bible. Let me say something first about the Quran. Obviously, as a Muslim, I will be in favor of the Quran, but let me tell you what, that, uh, uh, what, what my view of the Quran is more specifically. Uh, it seems to me that the Quran has a unified view about sin and salvation that runs throughout the text, and this is a reasonable view. First, it is a unified view. Even if one did not take the Quran to be the Word of God, one would take it to be uh, the writing of one man, the Prophet Muhammad, on whom we peace. And in that case, one would want to interpret the text in the light of that belief, that it was authored by one man, and so we would expect that the book would interpret itself. What is unclear in one place might be clear in another place. And, and because we have only one author, we would expect that the author is consistent with himself. Now when we read the Quran, we find that uh, the basic idea about sin is that uh, sin involves some kind of disobedience, uh, a transgression of God's law. It may be an omission of a command, or it could be some harm to God's creatures. Uh, the response to sin uh, is for human beings to seek the forgiveness of God. And the promise in the Quran is that if one is sincere in seeking that forgiveness, that God is always willing and ready to forgive, and that He will forgive. Now, in the final reckoning on the Day of Judgment, the deeds of people will be weighed, and uh, what will be considered is whether a person in his or her situation did his or her best in that situation. So that the deeds will be weighed to see if the person has had predominantly good deeds as opposed to bad deeds. And that means that human beings in the Quran are not expected to be absolutely perfect. In fact, we cannot be human beings as we are. We are frail, we are weak, and God created us with our weaknesses. He knows them, and uh, He is ready to overlook our shortcomings. He's just looking for sincere servants who are trying their best to serve Him. In the story of Adam in the Quran, we find uh, a lesson of original forgiveness, not a lesson about original sin, because Adam did uh, disobey God according to the Quran. But then the Quran says, and God then chose him and uh, forgave him and, and guided him. And the prayer which Adam was taught uh, in private to seek forgiveness from God is a prayer that Muslims recite to this day. Our Lord, we have forgiven wronged ourselves. And if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us, then certainly we would be the losers. Uh, we believe that when we recite a prayer like this sincerely, that God forgives us. Moreover, if we have harmed God's creatures, then we are required to do up the best we can and to repair that harm. It makes no sense to harm others and then ask God for forgiveness because uh, we, we understand that there are two basic rights that are due on, on us. One is the right of God and two is the right of the creatures of God. We say, Haqqullah wa ibad. And uh, it's not necessarily in that order. In fact, if we wrong God alone, then God can easily forgive us and He loses nothing. If we harm other creatures, then God does not forgive us until we do our best to repair our harm to the other creatures. So if you hurt somebody, try to do the best you can to seek their forgiveness and to repair what's wrong you have done. And, and, and when we do that, again, we ask God for forgiveness and God forgives us. So the, the Islamic doctrine then is uh, one that is based on the Quran, and the Quran's uh, presentation of this is unified throughout. <laughs> And uh, it is a reasonable doctrine. Now when we come to the Bible, we must do uh, separately with the Old Testament and with the New Testament. The Old Testament is basically the Jewish Bible, which Jews refer to as the Tanakh, or the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, in the Jewish Bible, 
which has now become part of the Christian Bible, uh, we find the basic proposition that uh, human beings must do their best to follow the commands and teachings of God. And if they do that, they will have uh, all the rewards which are promised in the book of Deuteronomy, for example, in, in Deuteronomy 28. And uh, on the contrary, if people would uh, turn away from the law of God and not follow God's teachings, then they will have uh, all of the kinds of di diseases and plagues and uh, negative effects that are mentioned in Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy is one of the books referred to as uh, the books of the Torah, said to be the Torah of Moses, the most important part of the Old Testament. The idea uh, that God rewards the good deeds and he punishes for wrongdoing is found throughout the Old Testament. And that is then a basic teaching. Moreover, it is, in the Old Testament it is clear that if one commits wrong, then there is a way to seek the forgiveness of God. Specifically, there are animal sacrifices which are detailed in the book of Leviticus. And several times, the book of Leviticus, part of the Torah as well, uh, promises that if you do this, you will be forgiven. So, just uh, very quickly, you can see Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20 verse 26, verse 31, and verse 35, and then going to Leviticus chapter 5, uh, verse 10, 13, 16, and 18. And there's several other passages where the same thing is mentioned. If you've committed a sin, you do this sacrifice, and your sins will be forgiven. Some people think that the sacrifice is only by blood, as if God somehow wants blood, and only by blood he will forgive sins. But that's not the idea, because some people could not afford the animal sacrifices, and then the substitute will be some cooking ingredients, and, and that is mentioned too in the book of Leviticus, chapter 5, verse 12. Again, it is said that if you do that, you will be forgiven. You bring the flower, you offer it on the altar, and God forgives you as well. And of course, after you're gone, the priest uh, then uses the, the flower. It is not only by sacrifice that so one gets one's sins forgiven. What is important in the Old Testament is the contrite heart of the broken spirit that the Bible speaks about. So the idea is for one to feel remorse after one has committed sins. This is the, uh, the essence of seeking God's forgiveness. And then it is promised that that too brings forgiveness. In fact, uh, many of the biblical prophets in the Old Testament uh, say that uh, what God desires is not uh, the, the sacrifice, but this very broken spirit and contrite heart. There is a, a verse in, in the uh, Psalms, which uh, some take to mean that uh, somehow we are born in sin. Uh, but as Herbert Haig in his uh, uh, book, uh, His Original Sin in Scripture, has pointed out, this passage could not be taken to mean that, uh, because that would run contrary to the whole thread of the Old Testament. If somehow we are born in sin, uh, then, Nothing else makes sense in the Old Testament. In fact, the overwhelming teaching is that which I've already presented, and that runs throughout the, the Old Testament. How then do we regard the sons? Well, sons uh, is poetic work, and in poetic works, people exaggerate the way they say things. So when David says that in sin my mother conceived me, we don't know what exactly he means. Does he mean that his mother conceived him through an adulterous relationship? Or is David looking at his own life and feeling such remorse that he pities himself, he finds himself so absolutely despicable on that occasion that he attributes that to the time of his, uh, his conception. And in that case, because this is a poetic work as opposed to the kind of pro prosaic and legislative works in the Bible, we cannot build too much on that and say that this means that there is such a thing as an original sin which is passed on to later generations. Let's then look at the book of Genesis and see if that gives us an idea of original sin, because this is often misunderstood. Uh, the story of Adam there in the book of Genesis is not really about original sin, in that nowhere else in the Old Testament does anybody look back and say, you know what? We are in a real problem because Adam committed the first sin. No, the story of Adam and his sin is told in the book of Genesis, but then it's over and forgotten about. It's as if Adam committed a sin, he bore the consequences, and then that's the end of the matter. We just move on, we live, we have commandments, we have to keep those, in which case God will reward us, or if we default and do not seek the forgiveness of God, then God will penalize us. 
Bethlehem is the Old Testament.